Cool, thank you. Right, so I think I think you probably all, all know us. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm from Library Services and uh, Michelle and I have been working on this research project together for I think the last 18 months now. So it's it's really ongoing um, action research, pedagogic research that's sort of continuing as we put things into practice and then reflect and carry on. Um, and as Sean said, we, we really came together as as researchers with a shared belief in the importance of UDL after that trip to De Montfort. Um, and we just kind of have this, this shared belief in the need to think about inclusion in the very broadest sense of the word. So what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to obviously give you a little bit of an overview of the project. I think some of you will have heard some of it before, so we're going to try not to, to go over old ground too much, but also give you enough context for those that perhaps haven't heard it. We're going to reflect a little bit on, um, on the kind of the critical lenses that we've been applying to this um since since we've started and, and how we're interpreting our findings now and that's very much with this framework of the fortress of academia and and what we've called the covid bomb and then um we've got some group discussion as well so uh, we've got some case studies to share with you that are around our communities of practice we are going to uh to kind of try and practice our udl beliefs we're not going to just transmit information at you for a full hour we we'll really encourage some uh, some reflection and comments um, I, I can't get Teams up on my uh, tablet, unfortunately, today. It won't do it without um, without kind of the sound. Uh, it just keeps sort of echoing back at me. So hopefully, um, if Michelle and Sean could keep an eye on the chat, if there's anything that comes up from the chat, if you want to pop questions in, if you want to put reflections in as we go, we very much welcome that. So you can be part of our kind of wider community of practice. Um, I just well, I, to, I was just going to say, Sarah, we've yeah. kind of got this next slide thing as well. So if you hear us say next slide, when we've not become Chris Whitty or anything like that. But uh, having done several presentations at conferences online, we kind of got into the habit of saying next slide. So just to warn you, um, there's no updates. It's it's just being able to operate at a distance. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you're all, all familiar with this sort of uh, way of operating now. Um, so just before I hand over to Michelle, I think the one thing we want to want to stress is that we've retrospectively realised that we're kind of developing these communities of practice as we've been going through the research process. So you find us now at a very reflective uh, point in, in, in our research process. So I shall hand over to Michelle. So, uh, so really, um what where we are starting is is that um of the research was that we we really felt after some discussions and some working together that uh, reading um would, would was seen as a barrier for in, for students engaged in he and as you as you may be aware the course that this research is taking place within is a foundation degree and with that we have uh a really broad demographic. Um, the demographic is changing within the course in recent years, um, but we do have um, differing educational backgrounds. We have a large number of students with dyslexia. Um, we have time poverty um, kind of situations where we've got you know uh, people that have families, caring responsibilities, and full time jobs. And all of this can impact on the student's ability and willingness to read. Um, and so it, it, we're also aware that the demographic of the course also brings, you know, additionality of barriers potentially. And as UDL practitioners, we were looking for ways to help break down these barriers for students. So next slide. <laughs> what we did um, to address the issues of reading, we thought what we'll do is we'll implement a technical solution. And so we embedded accessibility tools in the resource list across the whole programme. Um, and these included text to speech, speed readers, um, and you'll see that from the logos there on the slide, these are the ones we used and all of these were free resources. And so in the initial stage of the research, um, we conducted a student survey and we also set up a focus group, which um, was combined of those those that wanted to be within the teaching team part of that, just to find out more about their experiences from this, um, this kind of intervention that we'd made to kind of address a potential barrier to engagement. Now, um, 
It's all good, isn't it? When you do this research, you get engaged with it and we're really excited and we're kind of like, I suppose, those sort of passionate emerging researchers in this area and um, you, you can think that you've solved it. Um, and we, we have to kind of say with hindsight, we, we were pretty naive to think that that was um, an approach that could solve it. And so although we were very aware of the problem, and we thought we had a solution um, and we believe that we could fix this environmental barrier um, by providing a multimedial sort of means of engagement. Um, for example, one of the things that students can do is listen to text if they if they use this. But the reality is um, that the, the student take up wasn't as high and, and staff weren't initially that supportive. Now, <coughs> when we've kind of spent some time away from the research and we you know um good researchers need to not hold it too tightly don't they we need to hold it loosely in kind of um trying to see what the messages are um i think on reflection both sarah and i had um we'd really internalized the udl process and it was becoming very much part of our identity as both teachers and researchers and I think at this stage in our research, we come to the recognition as well that where we were in our UDL um, kind of journey was very different to those um, academics that were involved in the research. And so that that kind of maybe started to give us some insight of the need to drill deeper into some of the messages and the way the research was speaking to us. What could we do next? Okay, so so where where did we differ? I guess where where were the differences between our approaches and the, the team that we were working with? So um, we've already said we did some staff focus groups very early on. I think this was summer twenty nineteen um, with the staff that wanted to to join, and we found some attitudinal barriers. Is is the way we've conceptualised it afterwards. Um, and these are kind of paraphrased responses from what we were being told in those focus groups. Um, if you want to sort of hear a full rundown of, of all the different results and us really diving into the details, we've got um, webinars that we've done that are in the reference list. But these three kind of really summarise what was going on. So one, they said there are problems with the tools. So some of those were kind of perceived or potential. So they're saying, well, what if the student's Wi-Fi isn't good enough? Um, so that's kind of almost borrowing troubles that may or may not be there. They also said, well, actually, when we're playing around with the tools, because we gave them some sort of hands on time, they said, well, they found out that they didn't all work with all websites. And that's that's a legitimate problem. And it's something that publishers definitely need to work on. Um, they also said and there was a real feeling that they needed to be a super user. Like staff could not possibly recommend a tool to a student if they themselves were not you know, absolutely 100 percent confident in it. They couldn't say. I'm aware of this and you can use it. They had to know in 100% detail themselves how it worked. And that's quite interesting, I think, because when we think about communities of practice, that strikes me now as quite an individual response. I need to be a super user. And then they challenged us on, um, on to provide some evidence on what we were talking about. We'd, we'd also talked about audiobooks prior to accessibility tools. And they said, what's your evidence for all of this? Um, and this is an example of the kind of uh, challenge we were receiving. So we're saying, you know, is this academically sound is basically what we were being asked. What's your evidence? Isn't reading through listening different subtext, not as good as, um, you know, reading through sight? And, you know, they're, in, they're valid questions. It's good for us as researchers to be to be challenged on this stuff. Um, I would certainly say a visually impaired student might very vehemently disagree that that reading through listening is a, a different or lesser experience. But we've since reflected on where we think this attitude was coming from. And, and we think that this attitude is, is more uh, of an emotional barrier. And this is where we've started to think about all of this within the framework of, of the fortress of academia. So um, we we kind of, um, you know, it has been spoken about in, um, in in many writings, really, but we felt that the quote that we've used here was quite um, 
important in kind of directing our, our next sort of kind of presentation. And um, particularly when we went to Sweden, we, we kind of spoke about this notion of the fortress of academia. And actually it was quite well received as a, as a concept. Um, so um, basically, if we see the fortress of academia as the place where knowledge is housed and protected by the custodians, um, these are experts who know everything and impart their knowledge to students. But often without much analysis or thought, and this is a generalisation um, about how the knowledge is transferred. And I can see that the impact of the research has really made me challenge about that, the things that I'm holding tightly as far as knowledge is concerned and how that has an impact on the methods and the approach and in, in integrating the UDL approach. You know, it's about me as well as an academic being willing to hold things a little bit more loosely. Um, and on reflection, um, we think within the focus group, our research was challenging the identity of those custodians um, and um, of the knowledge within the fortress. And it was making people in the focus group feel uneasy. And I have to hold my hand up and say that I've had to kind of go through that reflective process and feeling uncomfortable and uneasy. And the very start of the challenge for me was I was consistently giving feedback, you know, at the end of summative assessments, read more widely and just kind of kind of giving that back to students but actually not internalizing what that might mean for me when you know why isn't that happening not questioning that but just seeing it as 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 something that I would do in feedback and we we have the sort of um relationship um with the community of practice within the focus group where there is that kind of dialogue professional dialogue and you know, it felt to us as researchers, we were receiving quite a defensive kind of response. Um, and again, not holding that too too tightly, just kind of letting that be part of what we were doing. And, and the conclusion that we came to was it was because we were challenging their academic identity. And, and that's not easy. And kind of as part of the reflective process, we were doing that ourselves. And so we were on that journey as well um, alongside them rather than being done to. We were part of, if that makes sense, within the research community. So there was this kind of willingness within the community um, of practice to have those really perhaps more difficult conversations around our own identities and and I think that that was kind of a turning point um, with with other things which we'll go on to um, and so we also know the idea of the fortress um, is being challenged as the kind of way in which higher education is seen and and that's an interesting context to sort of place our research in um, with this challenge to identity. And so custodians have had to become facilitators of learning, not just the gatekeepers. And they need to meet um, the with the wide demographic of students, their, their, their changing needs. And we do need to become co-constructors of learning and of the learning spaces and places and environments and never more so has that become more apparent in recent days. So um, kind of right at the very wall of this fortress, um, emotional barriers can become uh, problems in bringing down other environmental barriers and um, you know, we we still have this passionate desire to keep drilling down, to keep bashing away, to see where we could get um, to in kind of developing um, this very accessible approach to reading. So emotional barriers can imp impact on reflective practice. If we're if if we're honest, and in our research process, there's been days where I've kind of had to kind of go like this to Sarah and the next day have more of a reflective moment and come back um, and and not let that be my own blind spot. And, it, and it, it holds true even to those of us that are really committed to reflective teaching practice, that there we can have these blind spots when it's about our own identity. 
but we all know that if we take that moment and we take that very kind of proactive reflective pr approach we can use this to improve our own practice to teaching and learning but also to improve things for students and that that excites me so i'm willing to go through the emotional barrier of that to include that so the focus group really was our initial community of practice and we saw that participants focusing on the um, we, we, we saw that focusing on those tools which there was apprehension around we needed to spend some time teaching the team themselves how to use them so that's what we did that's the next intervention that we did rather than just reflecting on oh this could be that could be a problem, this could be a problem. So that was actually um, valuable in kind of acknowledging their need and then having time to explore them together. But what we also felt, <clears throat> and we needed to be really open and transparent within the focus group, and we, we've said this to them, that there was this vulnerability that staff were beginning to show as there was a mutual trust about the intentions of, of, of the research across the partnership. Um, and so that was in the focus group, if not kind of exposing that to the students within the classroom. So, um, for example, they were able to use their lack of digital com uh, confidence as a group. And um, we recognised that there was a developmental need there um, or because, you know, maybe they would said they needed to be a super user and maintain their expert status. So we could see sort of early glimmerings of a community, a community of practice that was wanting to engage together and they were ready to develop and learn more. And so we, we, we moved on to the next step, which I'm going to hand over to um, Sarah to discuss. Yeah, so this, this is a bit we've kind of called battering rams and, and bombs. Um, so we kind of felt at that initial point that, that we've sort of been battering on the door to the fortress for a while now, you know, trying to trying to make progress. And, and, and there absolutely was that sort of nascent community of practice willing, starting to willing to be willing to engage. But it was quite a slow process um, and definitely still some resistance in, in some places. Uh, and, you know, as, as we sort of said from the focus group responses, we were causing some some unrest, some disturbance, um, and we challenged attitudes a bit, but we'd not knocked them down. We'd not moved past them. We'd not got through the door yet. And then COVID turns up and it just kind of sticks a bomb right at the Castle's foundations. Um, and, you know, we can all say that COVID has been a truly dreadful, shocking, traumatic thing to happen to the world. And it absolutely is. But also in a weird kind of way, it's it's been a little bit of a, a research gift for us. Strange thing to say, um, because it's forced everyone to think about their, their teaching practices. Um, it's forced people to kind of consider and confront some of their those attitudinal barriers, those responses to, to, to digital teaching and learning and the tools that we're all now using uh, every day. And we've needed to change. We've needed to change really, really rapidly as a sector. Otherwise, our whole existence just becomes vulnerable. Um, and I think it's it's brought kind of a, a personal relevance with it. So, you know, people know they need to support students in a different way. We've had to sort of embrace what's been referred to as, as the digital pivot. Um, and, and this is an interesting idea. This, you know, we've, we've moved very quickly to the digital in a really short space of time. Um, and this is something that Julie Salmon uh, talks about. It's also worth noting though that not everyone kind of, it's not that people don't agree exactly, but the, the Donna Lanclo blog that we, we quote here, Donna talks about um, the idea that digital kind of becomes wrapped up in a moment of extreme stress and extreme trauma for people and actually there are going to be some people out there who aren't going to use this as a digital pivot, they can't wait to get back to normal behaviour. Um, so that's that's sort of an interesting uh, side that's worth pointing out. So, so you know, we need so COVID's kind of put this bomb under the foundations. It's made people have to to engage differently with with digital and then kind of increase that openness and that willingness that we were already seeing, and it's accelerated the process for us. So in uh, the summer of 2020, we had an away day with the, the partnership team again. Uh, and it was another opportunity to reflect on the research with them um, and to reflect on changes to online teaching and learning 
and on their confidence in adapting to new tools and technologies. So it's partly the research that we've been doing and partly the new world that we found ourselves in. And, and this is again one of the areas where we were kind of extending our communities of practice. So we were working with our existing community, hopefully with a slightly different mindset. And then we brought um, Elaine Swift in, and I know Elaine's here today. Hi, Elaine. Um, and we brought Elaine in to, to kind of talk to the team about, about digital confidence, digital capabilities, to talk them through a couple of the, um, the different tools and reflective pieces you can use to kind of assess your own digital capabilities. Um, so the GIST digital capabilities tool, and there was another one we used as well. They're in the references to this. Um, but we asked the team to, to reflect on their experiences, to sort of welcome another person into their community, um, to bring a different voice, a different set of experiences. And, and they were really willing to, to share their experiences, to share their feelings. Um, there was less, I think, resistance than we'd seen previously and a lot, a lot more openness. Um, and yeah, and what we saw, I think, from that was, was really positive. So there was full engagement across the whole group. There was a sense of coming together to drive change and positive change for the students. And again, as I said, there's that willingness to share, especially some of their vulnerabilities uh, and, and, you know, almost to laugh at the points where they're going, oh, I didn't know you could do that on, on Collaborate. Oh, that's really interesting. I can use that now. So what we're actually doing now, we think, is, is starting to bring down the attitudinal barriers within that community. So our initial research had kind of lit this, this slow burning fuse, if you like, and then COVID's the accelerant that, that means it kind of has to happen. Um, and you can see Freed here that this argument that the missing element for change is, is courage. And that's only found when people become willing to make a journey. And COVID weirdly has kind of supplied the, the courage or, or the motivation to go on that journey. And people are now much more willing to embrace the change. So when we've spoken to them again recently, there's a lot more openness to using these digital accessibility tools um, than we've previously seen and much more about, well, actually, it's really good to come together as a community to talk about what's available and how we might use it rather than that initial attitude we, we saw, which was, oh, but I'm not a super user. I can't use it. So we're going to shut up for a moment um, and actually share a case study with you. Um, Michelle, are you able to share the, the link in the chat? Uh, <laughs> um, I won't be able to do it if not. No, it's all right. I think I should be able to do it. I, um, just because I've got two different things set up, Sarah. Sorry, if I, I'd have known, I'd have had it ready. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's just because my um, my technical issue is this end. It's I'm fine. Sorry. We're good. So we're just going to pop a link to the case study in the hopefully in the chat for this. If I can get to the chat for this. some reason I cannot actually get to the chat that's not very helpful chat with participants I think we're okay right there we go oh Right, so I've put, the, I've put the, um, the link in the chat to the first case study. We would like you to just have a, a few minutes to read the case study and add any reflections that you might have to the chat. It's quite a small and concrete case study. Um, it's a very sort of, it's a moment in time, if you like, but it's, it's really useful in reflecting on some of these ideas about relinquishing expertise, making use of the community, students' attitudes to, to reading. And I will say we've got two case studies today and we've used a bit of a storytelling approach in them. And we found that's been really helpful in bringing practice to life and um, making it specific. And, and we've shared these case studies with the partnership team this week, actually. And it's been so exciting to see how much they've moved on from that, that earlier position to, to where they are now and the willingness to, to kind of uh, engage with all of this stuff. So if you just take a few moments to, to read that case study, any reflections that you might have, if you pop them in into the chat, um, and we can kind of comment on them. And I'm going to take this opportunity to, to read the comments that you've already written. Sorry to intervene on this, but um, I'm used to using Teams. I do not see the chat function here. I do not see a chat icon here. I've got participants, I've got raise hand, I've got the other stuff. I don't have um, 
chat. I don't know if anybody else has that problem. No, I don't either. I can't see it either. I, I can't either. Oh, that's really bizarre. Um, I'm not oh, sure. What's, no. I'm not sure what's happened there. I'll tell you what I'll do. Actually, uh, for those folks who can't um, access the chat function, I'll quickly get a OneDrive document up and open. Multiple means of representation mm -hmm. and engagement. This is part of UDL. Is that we draw on all of the different tools that we have. So I'll put a link into. I was going to say into the chat function. That won't work, will it? Um, <laughs> so, for some reason. Um, What's that? But for some reason, Sean, this um, this this meeting seems to be operating differently to other meetings on Teams. Oh, so I think I know what it might be for 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 uh, people who are outside of the inclusion by design group. You may oh, have okay. limited functionality. I think that's probably what it is. So um, I wonder how I could actually how I could actually share that function, or if I can encourage people I don't know maybe just write them down and 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 keep them as as notes for yourselves Lisa did you want to make a suggestion yeah, can, there? can you copy the link and send it to the email for those people who agree to attend yeah I'm not sure that 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 I will be able to send an email to, to everybody but I can give it a go and um, in the interim if you just maybe write down some notes oh you're not able to access the um, you're not able to access the actual case study that's the issue as well isn't it yeah um, so okay did you want to share the case study visually on the screen uh, Sarah so that that way folks can can see it uh, that, if, it, okay? if it helps, I can share it from the screen. That saves Sarah staying in on her screen for herself. Yeah, That's yeah, good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice idea, Setu. Thank you. That that that's very helpful. That's okay. So when people have read it, if you let me know, I'll scroll up, scroll down. Is it big enough? Yeah, that's that's better, uh, Setu. So hopefully you've all had a, a chance to, to have a, a read through that. Yes, Lisa, I couldn't agree more. Talk to the librarians. We are here to help. <laughs> so we may have to kind of articulate what's in the chat function. Um, we'll have to add voice to what's there. So Lisa has just shared the the fact that lecturers maybe don't remember or think to contact the librarians enough and Lisa shares their, that they're a font of knowledge and keen to work and, it, and this case study demonstrates how keen staff are to identify solutions so I think it's it's that one of those things is coming through there oh I should step away it's not my, my, my research but it's that basis of interdisciplinary working and communities of practice so people across the board kind of coming together yeah 
Yeah. And this is actually <laughs> Colin has just shared that librarians are going to receive a flurry of emails as a result of this <laughs> research. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps should have warned my team about that. <laughs> and, and I think I think what what for me this was beginning to do, and it's probably where we'll sort of go to next, really, was that um the students were seeming to know what to read because they wanted to be able to do the reading. And I thought maybe that's me being a bit optimistic. This is one student, Michelle, hold your horses, don't get too, too, no, don't hold this research too tightly. Keep reminding myself to let it, let it go a bit. Um, and um, it, it, for me, it was really exciting that we could kind of get that advice and, and get the student engaging um, and also give them the advice that I'm not the expert on what's best for this, but within the community practice, there were people that I could call upon. Mm. I'm just mindful of the time, actually, so we yeah. should probably just move on to, to the next bit, um, which I now have to find. There we are. I think back over to you, Michelle. Yeah, so so far we've talked a lot about the teaching team and their responses um, and um, we also have data on the student responses regarding the accessibility tools and what the student survey in 2019 revealed was uncertainty about reading, um, you know, what to read, how to read how much to read, when and why. And these responses also backed up many of our early assumptions of, about students reading. Um, and so we've, we've sort of taken um, this information to sort of then kind of inform what strategies um, would further in, sort of enable that engagement. And, and we started to take that forward. Move on to the next one. And so, um, the other thing that was a bit of a disappointment because we, we talked about, you know, we, we, we'd we seen this barrier, we've got these tools, all good in the land of research. So, you know, naively we thought, um, but actually we could see that the students hadn't really spotted those accessibility tools, even though there was a great big list of them at the start of the reading list. And only one had made use of them with positive effect. So again, we, we really identified that we needed to make some pedagogic changes in our approach in response to this. So we really wanted to move into that place where the research was informing teaching and learning strategies. Um, and we definitely want to do more sort of kind of, um, you know, research around this area. But these these things are changing um, in the times that we're finding ourselves. So um, we're going to move on to the um, next case study which again hopefully we can bring up yeah. this this is slightly longer um, and again we just want you to have a read through because this this is how the pedagogic changes occurred in the summer of 2020 um, and how we used um, an opportunity of a newly validated program to kind of implement these so it probably needs to be made a bit bigger yeah, let me see. Setu, how, I don't know if you can help me. How did you increase this? Yeah, slide? the three dots just by your yeah, photograph the and, the pro and the profile. Oh, perfect. OK, good for you. Yeah, and the pluses. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good on you, Setu. Is that kind of large enough now that we get a yeah. sense? Of OK, great. So as Michelle says, this one's a little bit longer, but it brings in quite a number of the strands that we've been talking about.
What are OLAs? Um, online learning activities. Sorry, that's that's a good point. I need to make sure that we we include that in this. <laughs> I did think about that yesterday and I forgot. Did you think, yeah, sorry. I you you know the lingo, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm presuming people are um, kind of reading at my own considered pace here. <clears throat> huh. Great. Hazel has just commented, librarians sound like the key at this stage. I'd like to think we're the key at every stage. <laughs> I'd like to say that you're the key that goes in the lock, but then the person has to hold the key as well. If you get <laughs> <what> you <mean. laughs> OK, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that people have had an opportunity to read that. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I shall stop presenting. And uh, because I I think um, well, it's up, up to you guys, but because I think there's um, some folks that haven't been able to kind of put into the chat box, what you might have to do is just get their their views. But I'm conscious of time as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if anyone's got anything sort of burning they want to, to reflect on, just just stick your microphone on and shout out. Anybody who's familiar with the Universal Design for Learning uh, framework, to me, what comes out of this is the um, executive functioning. So that actually you're providing the learners themselves with the tools to self-reflect and be able to kind of uh, equip themselves with what they require for their own learnings. So that capacity for self-reflection is very, very strong. It really shows through in the case study. I think Val had her hand up there, but over to you. Thanks, Sean. Um, apologies for coming in late. Um, and so this may have already been addressed, uh, Sarah and Michelle. But was there any um, any analysis done that looking at students from different backgrounds, different qualification on entry, for example, or different ethnicities, to see whether or not there was any any patterns or or anything that was identifiable around people's journey pre-entry to HE? Because I think uh, you know understanding where students have come from in into the institution is key as a whole you know as a whole part of the of the design-led approach um no so we did with our student survey we we did have um what year they were in um i think that was in wasn't it michelle i feel like there's something else that we... which partner they were studying at That's so we, we had a kind of a view of their demographic mm. um which then also gave us we were able to look at different types of engagement kind of data linked to where the person lived, if that makes sense. Yeah, and we, we've done that initial tour, but um, sort of going back to the students is something we're, we're quite passionate to kind of, you know, to kind of strengthen their kind of uh, moving forward, that kind of their role within the community of practice when looking at teaching and learning. And so there is a stage two, which we'll kind of let you know about in a minute. But I think I think absolutely. Um, and I guess how that's been gleaned is, is from those antidotal sort of conversations with students and through the email processes that we're receiving, where they kind of share that information with us. But I think the profiles of the students does have a massive impact. I think you're spot on there and it's yeah. something that is really valuable that you've raised that we can, yeah. you know, highlight. We've already highlighted, but it's super highlight as we move forward. So thanks, Val. That's really useful. Mm, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we, we can just share a little bit of institutional data around this. Um, the more we're looking um, deeper and deeper at, at particular intersectional um, impacts on students, qualification on entry appears to be becoming more and more um, an area that we're, we're obviously identifying where bigger, bigger gaps open up for students, regardless of, of background. But that qualification on entry and previous experience yeah. seems to be really key. Yeah, thank you. That's really um for me, this case study just shows the sort of how within the project now the community of practice is almost interwoven and interlinked and connecting and um, 
the, the the fact that there's the relationship with different people within the community of practice they're kind of tools for the for, for, for me potentially as an academic to kind of pull in and kind of let go of that need to be the expert can't be the expert in all things but I can I can work within a community of practice and really kind of give that super kind of experience to the student as they kind of recognize as, as Shauna said you know where their learning is what they need uh, and and who is best placed to support them in that journey so I, I you know I think it's quite um exciting mm. yeah and 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 the fact that the students you know anecdotally in the past the student would have seen that reading was not available and gone oh well won't do it but because the, the reading has kind of been been centered and it's so so clear to them now what they have to read when and why when it's not there they're getting in contact and, and triggering off that whole uh the the actions of that whole community of practice so i think you know there's those two strands to it there that i think are both really important right i'm just quite mindful of time at this point so we've only got a few two or three slides left um this is just to highlight the new resource list that was mentioned in that case study. So we used to have all the tools to help with reading at the beginning of all the foundation degree resource lists. They're now in a standalone resource list. It's the tools that we used to have, plus a few extra bits and bobs, like um, how to update the accessibility settings on your iPad to make it easier for you to, to read and manipulate text. So that is there now for everyone within the university to make use of, to link to um, as you need to. Um, you know, sort of throwing it out to the wider community of practice, if you like. And if there's things that you think that should be on there, give us a shout. We can start building them in. Um, and it's also going to be embedded in a new study skills portal that I am working on with colleagues as well. So that's just a, just a highlight that's that's there and is available. And I think um, what's important, Sarah, is it's kind of, you know, having developed this, had a go with it, found, you know, we've we've kind of made a few mistakes with it and we feel this is like, now we're willing to kind of say come on let's just put it out there within the university wouldn't it be great if this was at the start of every resource list every student could kind of have this strategy to sort of help themselves in a way so mm. it's kind of building that sort of kind of self autonomous sort of learner as well um yeah. but so it's a kind of little ricochet we feel from the research as well don't we sarah it was a, a tool that was there that was developed with the librarians and then now we've kind of we want to share it more widely so that you've all um uh you've all got access to that yeah and it's it's you know it's kind of a self-serve menu really students can look at it and, and and work out what they need so you can just see at the bottom of the screen there um you know it says there's lots of strategies and methods to engage with reading and it gives context to all of the tools so the text to speech ones kind of says oh, you know do you find it easier to listen than to than to read on a page then here's some tools that might help you so it gives them a reason for engaging with them not just here's a massive list of tools you've got to you've got to work with it's okay what's going to work for me and then yeah we, we sort of touched on where we're going next but um michelle just if you want to wrap up with the uh, with where we're taking this now yeah so we don't feel that this is concluded we're, we're kind of in a where next stage um and because we feel this is ongoing action research so our next steps um we want to do more research on accessibility tools using our community of practice and so it'd be great if you know you do decide to use that tool and then come back to us and share your share the information there and we know that the team Teaching team are key to student engagement within this um, and you know the, the the foundation degree team that we have across the partnership are more confident and willing to have a look at this and again in our recent away day let's go back and have another look let's see what we can learn to use and you know alongside this gives you tools as a, a pat as well to give that initial support to students that you know maybe want to explore some of these different manipulations of text to en enable the engagement um, another sort of um, element of what we've been doing we've been able to start talking to sage um, who are a publisher and part of our wider we're trying to in, get them in the net of the wider community of practice and we've had some initial meetings with them to talk about an audio book project and we're we're sharing sharing the interest and and when we sort of talked to them initially about our initial research 
um, they were quite interested in how students may want to en um, engage in a multimodal um, approach to learning, which was really exciting. Uh, we need to start publishing. We're in the process of writing at the moment. Um, we've been sharing our research at conferences and in webinars, including one Swedish UDL conference. And, and we kind of did a kind of, we were quite nervous about going in there. There were some, you know, some quite leading lights in UDL. But when we got to talk to uh, other participants, um, we um, we felt that um, that we were kind of a little bit ahead of the game in our in our thinking. And, and we were, you know, we have had made some contacts there as well to explore things further. Um, we want to kind of um, think about the more training to embed those digital com uh, competency um, skills and the librarians are delivering sessions on that. Sarah, can I ask you just to quickly fill in fill in on that, please, around the, you know, how that's happened in the partnership and the uses of the tools. Is that OK? Because I think yeah. we've got we yeah. some good feedback, didn't we, this week on that? We did. We got some really interesting feedback from, from the partnership team. So, <clears throat> So the librarians haven't done too much on these accessibility tools, but what they have done is sessions on on just making ebooks work for you. So you know all the different things you can do with an ebook, like um, like finding information just using Control F, adding notes, bookmarks, all those sorts of things that students have absolutely no idea about as a rule. And the feedback we got was that those things were, were just really really helpful um, for both the students and the staff. So there's a lot of interest in us doing some of that, perhaps perhaps in a, uh, like a summer school or pre-sessional uh, situation and, and building in um, some of the stuff around these digital accessibility tools or equally just, you know, sticking one in beginning of every week, for example, five, ten minutes just to this is a thing. This is how you would use it. And now back to the, the subject um, subject matter. And so, so yes, possibly the really way they um a partner uh, course leaders had said that they'd had the subject librarian in they'd um they teamed in into the classroom and the students were had access access to laptops and computers and the on the big screen was um sarah and jennifer doing their bit and then the students were actually manipulating um, the ebooks in the, in the classroom and making notes and it's just been it's just been really really positive and um, so already in our sort of away day last week people were saying to Sarah, we need to book these in this is where we want them there was a, a, a renewed passion mm. about um, put, getting the experts in to kind of encourage students and I think there was some reflection about that not being part of induction, but being a sort of separate um, session. Yeah. And yeah. then and that's I, such, sorry, just to jump in, that's such a light, you know, light years away from we can't recommend these because I am I am not personally a super user. That's such a change in mindset. So and then the, really the final thing about what next is we, we, we want to kind of over this year really pay attention to the changes that the pedagogical, um, you know, approach may have um, in, in centering the reading. So um, one of the things we're going to be looking at is are the students referencing the material that's on the list? So there's a bit of work to be done there probably over the summer. And do they incorporate them better into their assessments? And then finally, you know, a, a big question, do grades improve? Um, so that's where we're going. That's just initial thoughts. And, and, and what we found with this snowball you know um we we do something we make an intervention and then the reflection time um has been really really valuable and kind of d in developing that community of practice i'm i'm done sarah <laughs> excellent i'm aware we haven't actually left too much uh, time for for a q a but obviously be more than welcome to to have any reflections that you may have or any questions that you'd like to ask that's great. Thank you. You prompted just a, a, a lot of uh, reflecting from me in relation to this. And I think what you're doing is you've captured the um, the potentials for from the shift to online learning, particularly, you know, the whole nature of how we access, create and disseminate knowledge has has shifted. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think with that shift, there's a necessity to kind of reinterpret our familiar familiarity with the um, <clears throat> terrain in which we find ourselves because it's a different space it's a different space and I think because the tools are so different we need to kind of think 
it was kind of like, you know, when I went, went to primary school, there was an inkwell, you know, with kind of a bottle of ink and a blotting paper. So that kind of dates me a little bit, folks. But you, you got to think about the, and the transition to the biro was just phenomenal. You didn't have to dip all the time. And I think here what we're, what we're recognizing is to some extent there's been a diver, diversification of the tools and we have to stop and reflect and think what tools are useful and what are going to be helpful to facilitate learning. And in relation to that, what I'm going to come back to Val's point around the necessity to get into the fine detail around uh, understanding where our learners come, come from. Yes, but also understanding that this is for everybody, that, it, that the whole concept around universal design for learning is that accessibility ought to be across the board and, and that it's going to be helpful for those learners who come from uh, all sorts of backgrounds. I won't get into kind of and, specificities in relation to that. Um, sorry, Sarah. And, and that's, that's sort of yeah. absolutely one of our, our starting points, really. So, so listening to a text rather than reading it visually, that's potentially useful for okay, a student who's got a visual impairment. That's also potentially useful for a student who is really, really busy and is looking after the kids and is caring and actually just want to listen to the book in the car or whilst they're doing the, the 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 washing up you know it's 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 inclusion in that very very broadest sense that we're really yeah. interested in absolutely and listen maybe what we can do is open it up i know that there's we're there's nothing stopping us at you know at two o'clock but I, I i suspect that colleagues other colleagues may want to go to other places and whatnot but I do want to engage in discussion and um, and to open it out a little bit. So if people have questions or observations, and I do have to apologize, it's my, my problem. I'll, I'll think about that in the future in relation to setting up these inclusion by design uh, gigs. And one of the things that's actually come into the chat box was, was it uh, Harris, was it Peter? Peter Harris, I think, indicated how he, he has been doing some work around uh, 3, 3D printing in, in so tactile accessibility. So we're going to get you to come in at some other stage to, to share that information. Thanks, Helen, for coming along. I see you've got to uh, jump along to another meeting. But if anybody has any questions or observations, please, please come. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was also one of those individuals on that bus that went to Leicester all those years yeah. ago. And Michelle and I have had in a regular conversations in the hallway of, of Braden on oh we're doing this and we're doing that and and I just love the fact that you've done the research underpinning it because I know for our department um, it's it was very much a cross department activity when we first learned about UDL but now there's more courses that have joined us and it's kind of reminding me that that support and development within the whole department requires some further input and, and really trying to look at the inclus inclusion toolkit to see how we can incorporate that, but perhaps to work together across the foundation degrees. I've, mm -hmm. I've seen your tools for accessibility and have actually sent students to that resource list who've been looking for it. So there are others already using that um but i think training on how to use it so staff actually understand it would be really beneficial and, and i guess we have a lot of similarities in terms of the types of students that that are attending our course so perhaps a cross school cross department activity of some sort would be really interesting mm, I, th I think that's something that is is essential really isn't it to yeah again, making that net wider and uh, of the community of practice and um interestingly enough at least i think we we've got students placed in 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 similar places as well and i do think that has an impact as well on yeah. on the, the way that they access things so i think that would be really exciting as an outcome of of today and i think the other thing is some of your students come on to our top ups and some of our students go on to your yeah, top exactly. up so there is already that recognition that health and education actually they're, they're combined they're they're not really they're separate but they're there's a big overlap and, and a lot of our students consider education and early years placements as their focus so mm. it would be interesting to see what we could do yeah i think that's great lisa it's really exciting thank you i'm, I'm sorry folks i've got to jump out now but so i'm going to leave michelle to handle any further questions 
what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, but thank you. Thanks to everybody who came along and uh, thanks to everybody who's kind of learned from this and, and who are going to, I'm sure, be impacted by your enthusiasm and your insights. And I'm sure you're going to get lots of questions from lots of other colleagues as well. But really appreciate everyone coming along this afternoon and um, and feel free to jump onto the metaphorical bus at this stage. The other bus maybe left four years ago, but um, but the the uh, ideational one and the conceptual bus is still on the go, folks. So um, please come and join us at Inclusion by Design. So great to have you here this afternoon and take care of yourselves. Have a lovely weekend. You deserve it. All right. <laughs> Bye. All the, all the best, folks. Bye-bye.